evening all. I hope you're having a nice weekend um, and enjoying the uh, nice sunny weather. Uh, today I was out uh, umpiring a cricket match, uh, hence my tan. Um, cricket uh, has been in the forefront this week because of the uh, Ollie Robinson um, incident where uh, a number of his uh, tweets social media activity uh, dating back nine years was unearthed to show that he had said some uh, offensive things um, and that was nine years ago but apparently not only has uh, it resulted in him uh, issuing an apology for it um, he has also uh, he was suspended from all England international matches pending an investigation that investigation hasn't happened yet, and it might mean further uh, sanctions on him, further punishments. But also, he has announced that he's stepping down from playing all cricket uh, for Sussex and England uh, for the foreseeable future. So it has really escalated. People were trying to tell me, oh, don't worry, he'll just miss one match. You know, it's just a little suspension, but it has spiralled. Uh, since then, they were telling me um, his career isn't over, it isn't threatened. Well, it looks at this stage as if it's uh, threatened. And this has got me uh, thinking about um, a kind of the, the intransigent nature of these things. These things are so absolute that the punishment is everything for, for whatever misdemeanors and that there's no statute of limitations. I asked... People who agreed with Ollie Robinson's uh, suspension, um, okay, what's the statute of limitations on the tweet? How long ago should something that was written on social media uh, still be relevant um, before we start saying it's just a long time in the past, the uh, landscape was a little bit different then. And also take into account that Ollie Robinson was 18 when he wrote these tweets, you know, um, he's trying to be edgy. And that there were also other England cricketers, um, most notably James Anderson, who is being um, investigated. Well, he was, um, uh, he wrote some things on social media as it existed then back uh, 23 years ago. So this was back in the 1990s when lad culture, you know, the word, uh, edgy Channel 4 uh, programs, Loaded magazine, um, were to the forefront. And so people back in the 1990s did say a lot of edgy things, uh, jokes that could be construed as uh, sexist or, uh, I wouldn't say racist, but played on stereotypes. And uh, who was to know back then what the uh, political climate would be in 2021? Um I don't know if anything more is going to happen to a wider bunch of England cricketers, although um, the captain, Joe Root, has uh, offered some apology and said something about they have to look deep within themselves and be ashamed and so on and so forth. But I saw um, an interesting thing. It's on the, um, the Spectator TV uh, channel on YouTube, and I think it's... Uh, it's interesting to know, so I'll put the description in the link below. But it was um, James, um, I think it's James Forsyth, uh, Douglas Murray and Kate Andrews uh, talking about uh, the government and, and the culture wars in general, should the government stand up uh, for British traditions in the culture war. Now, uh, James said something that was... Um, interesting but i think is wrong i think he's he's missed something here it's a it's a nice idea what he says but i think he's missed something and that is um he said that we must have uh, discussions with sensible people on the left about cultural issues and the cultural stuff in order to try and uh not be so i don't know so combative and uh ultra-partisan and ultimately destructive. We need to seek out the sensible members of the left. My point to James would be, okay, who are those people? Um, there are people on the left who are more open-minded and more sensible and understand where um, people from a different political stripe uh, are coming from. So I would say Paul Embry is one, Dan Hodges, uh, mostly, because you get good Dan and bad Dan. 
Um, in the Americans, Barry Weiss, uh, the Weinstein brothers, um, who else would I have? Jonathan Haidt. I mean, these are people who you would call the sensible left, but where are they in uh, establishment circles? Well, they're nowhere. Uh, Embry and uh, Hodges, I believe, have been thrown out of the Labour Party. They're, they are no longer wanted in the UK Labour Party. Um, Barry Weiss, the Weinstein brothers, they've all been hounded out, and Jonathan Haidt has been sidelined because he is deemed to be alt-right adjacent, because he is f friends with Jordan Peterson and a number of other intellectuals on the right, so he gets sidelined, pushed aside, uh, discarded, which is a shame because he is a fantastic psychologist, um, and he, the book The Righteous Mind is, and The Coddling of the American Mind, those two books are, are must-reads uh, for people of all different kinds of political persuasions. And I think The Righteous Mind is a book that uh, the so-called normies would understand. I le I've lent it out to people who aren't that politically engaged. They really like it. They, they find things that they can identify with there. But who else are there who's sensible? Because what we've got at the moment is a system, and you see this with the football, and you see this with Black Lives Matter and the protests and everything else. And if you have a look at the way the English Football Association and the English Cricket Board have treated uh, fans' response to taking the knee, it's that they just don't care what the fans have to say. They have, they're obstinate, they're pig-headed, they've shut them, their minds off. Um, so the FA issued a statement on taking the knee, and they've basically painted the fans as something that they are not. And what I've, I've tried to do is say to people who defend taking the knee, well, have you listened to the fans? And they go, no, the fans are racist. But how do you know that? How do you know that? Are you listening to them? Because if you listen to the fans, they would say it's not about racism. This is about the links taking the knee has to Black Lives Matter. It's about the intrusion of politics in football and um, the uh, virtue signalling of it. You know, um, people are pointing out, well, there's hypocrisy because uh, the footballers are taking the knee to combat, you know, make a stand against injustice. But they were happy to play in... Uh, the World Cup in Russia two years ago, and they're happy to play the World Cup in Qatar uh, the next time that comes around, and that they're not exactly beacons of tolerance and liberty and uh, fairness. So, you know, um, what's the point? Taking the knee is an empty gesture. Um, but they won't hear of it, you know, the, from the FA, the players, Gareth Southgate, and the people who get on social media to, just to lambast people who have a different point of view as racist or, or against f combating racism. It's just a smear. You try and explain to them, they shut their minds down. They're absolutely shut down. They will not hear it. You know, as Andrew Claven did a video back in 2014 called uh, The Debate Is Over. You know, the debate is over. The matter is settled. You know, the science is in. You're on the wrong side of history. You know, it's just all these closing the mind off and not responding. And, and if anybody who defends taking the knee or if anybody in the FA or the ECB are watching, I doubt they will, but you never know. Just, just I just say to people, listen, people have got grievances. And, and I think this is this is interesting. The last five years since Brexit has seen um, the peak of this. I say the, the beginnings of the kind of intransigent, I won't listen to another opinion on the subject, I think began with the, uh, the ban of uh, handguns following the Dunblane massacre. I think you had the people who were uh, in favour of a complete uh, firearms ban would not hear any other counter argument. They just shut, it, shut the mind off. And the public debate uh, didn't become a debate in the end. It was just, we know what we're doing, you lot of gun freaks, and you're cut out of the discussion, even though this issue affects you. And we saw this with Brexit. Um, I might do a video one of these days in doing ways in which Brexit could have been avoided. And I don't say that as uh, somebody who supports Remain. I say this as somebody who's trying to be practical. There were many things over 30 years that the EU and its supporters could have done 
to win people's hearts and minds over and carry them forward, but it would have meant compromising on a few things. It would have meant not um, pushing forward with uh, a certain agenda and having to uh, redo that agenda, change the agenda, uh, to modify it, to um, incorporate people who had doubts and worries. And it's the same thing now, you know. Um, there could be a solution to fighting racism in sport and at the same time bring the majority of people along. But they refuse to listen to it. They refuse to counter, countenance any idea other than their own. And this is what we get. So, you know, um, I will say again, the sensible people on the left, that we can discuss this and that they will have influence, that they will somehow go back and say, OK, we've listened. Maybe we'll approach this from a different angle. Maybe we can work together. Maybe we can air out, we can air our point of view. You can air your point of view. Since the was it synthesis antithesis? No, thesis antithesis synthesis. Um, but you're not going to get that. You're not going to get that at all. It's just going to be this is my way or the highway. And until then, keep chanting, keep booing, keep making a stink, everyone. Um, because what else have you got to do? You've been backed into this position, you know, and uh, it's not on the booing fans' head all this. This is on the heads of those who won't listen. So until next time, have a good week.